Você vê, Lê. Dear members and viewers of White Army, welcome to at another special session. Dear friends, uh, in our medical field, if you ask me, the, one of the most important and fundamental aspect in the practice, in the clinical practice, that is uh, ethical practice. One, one, one ethics is the main issue. Second thing is the uh, what we are facing nowadays. The most uh, the, uh, the the burning topic in our field is the medical legal issues. Yeah, this topic has got most significance in uh, recent times. So, and uh, there is no one to guide us in this regard, no one to help, especially the junior doctors uh, to help in this regard to how to, to avoid this uh, legal, medical legal issues and how to go about it. If in case any, if you face medical legal issues and uh, how to uh, go about it, there is no, no particular guidance in this regard. But this is the most uh, practical aspect and uh, most of the uh, uh, junior doctors facing nowadays. So uh, we decided uh, there should be a special session by one of the most renowned uh, mentors or faculty in the field, one of the best in this field. So that all our members, White Army members, uh, can uh, know about the what all the uh, medical legal issues and how to face them and especially how to prevent them and uh, how to go about it. And uh, when I when I think about the forensic medicine or medical legal issues uh, or ethical practice, whatever, I only one name arise in my mind. That is Dr. Edukul, sir. Yes. Dr. Edukul means dynamism. Dynamism means Edukul. It's a synonym. Okay. No exaggeration about it. I know him for more than 10, 12 years now. And uh, he was my senior, he was my postgraduate also when I was doing a UG in Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute, Bangalore. And uh, now presently, uh, sir is a associate professor in uh, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, B.B. Nagar, Hyderabad. And uh, he's known for his uh, uh, perfection and uh, he's an all-round personality, be it uh, academics, be it uh, cultural activities, be it sports. He leads us from the front in every aspect and uh, he's a role model and inspiration to all the juniors like me. Yes, he, I, we consider him as the role model and are trying to emulate him in this regard. So I requested him, sir, uh, we, want a, we want to have a session uh, regarding medical legal uh, aspects and uh, like basics, basic aspects, like starting from how to write in prescription properly. What we are following most of us are not proper methods. So from the internship itself, let's follow the proper methods, how to write in prescription, how to uh, document a particular thing, it may be death summary or a death certificate or whatever it is, how to document a particular thing or uh, be it, uh, what to say, uh, any, anything, how to counsel the attenders, how to manage the any uh, situation during the casualty, maybe. Oh, so all these things, the basic things, okay, uh, mo no one is there to help us in this regard. So when we requested Edukul, sir, uh, he readily agreed. Uh, he's known for that. He's known to help his juniors. Even when I, my, myself, when personally, when I on, I'm in trouble, I always contact Edukul, sir, whatever it may be. So he always guided us, helped us, and motivated us and uh, to become the best. So... Edukul sir is the best in this field to guide us. So Edukul sir, on behalf of all the members of the White Army, we welcome you. And it's we feel it's a real uh, privilege and fortunate uh, we are uh, to have you with us for this session. Earlier also you have guided us uh, in the now you have we are you are with us to take at another session. Welcome to you sir and over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Kishan. Uh, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, a very good evening to all the young doctors uh, of the White Army. I think uh, Kishan is doing a tremendous job in uh, you know uniting uh, the young doctors across the country to upgrade ourselves. Yes, uh, nobody. Uh, I mean, everyone faces these issues, but nobody comes forward to you know uh, uh, sort of uh, to solve others' problem. So in this regard, I think he's done a, a, a you know a very good job in. Uh, be it academics or viva everything i mean he has covered everything in the medical field uh, thanks for that and uh, thank you white army for providing me the platform to interact with uh, the young uh, doctors of india um, with this uh, i think uh, we'll start with the presentation uh, myself uh, dr yadukul 
uh, associate professor in uh, forensic medicine, AIMS, uh, Bibinagar, Hyderabad. So I'll be going through uh, uh, the important aspects of the medical legal issues that we as medicos face in our day-to-day -day life. I think we all know the fact that the doctor is the boss of the hospital. Uh, and uh, we have been rightly called as uh, the Vaidya Narayano Hari. Uh, the doctor is treated next only to the God. And this has been for centuries that uh, God is treated next to, the, uh, you know, um, something very great. But being the uh, boss of the hospital, we as the uh, creamy layer of the society, we tend to step back in certain conditions. So what are those three instances where we being a doctor step back is one when the hospital, a police enters. When a police enters into the hospital, even though uh, we being uh, you know, experienced doctors, we tend to step back. We don't want to take you know, legal or something which is related to the police. We tend it is not our duty and we just you know, try to skip from that particular case. And the second scenario is when a lawyer enters into the hospital. Again, uh, we think so many things uh, regarding the lawyer. He will put all uh, the legal aspects and again, we tend to go back. And the worst part of uh, among the three is this, the media, be it print media or the visual media. And off late, I think uh, the doctors or medicos or the health workers working in a hospital are kind of scared when these three scenarios they face in their life. One is police, lawyer, and the media. And we, we'll be thinking why these three enter into the hospital scene and we are not given that free hand to practice what we know. The answer for this is medical legal cases. So in each and every medical legal cases, we uh, usually, you know, get to see these three people in our hospital premises and uh, being the you know toppers of the institute or topping all the uh, subjects coming out fresh we will be you know uh, we can treat all the cases and all those things but one single case will a medical legal case wherein the police will enter uh, do all the records the media people enter and question all those things the things which we are practicing here where we are caught and it is, you know, we'll be in a situation where we cannot express to the seniors or the juniors and we have to solve by ourselves. This is the case in many junior doctors, which, uh, you know, they face when they uh, encounter a medical legal case. So in my uh, presentation today, I'll be dealing with these things. One is the duties of medical practitioners. The main important is second is consent, professional negligence. I will not go in detail about the negligence, but uh, uh, brush your MBBS knowledge. Documentation, which is very important, be it you are working in a clinic or in a corporate hospital. Broad debt cases. This one uh, scenario where, you know, uh, uh, a lot of dilemma is there in the medical uh, practice. Recent and acts and amendments related to the medical field and the recent COVID guidelines, uh, guidelines related to the um, medical legal practice. So this will be uh, my presentation today. Yeah, why uh, medical legal uh, issues are so much important is a recent uh, study by National Law School in Bangalore says there is 40% increase in cases of medical negligence. This is a very high number, 400% increase in medical negligence. 90% of these cases in medical negligence involve the hospitals. And the most, you know, uh, what is terrifying here is 12% of the cases decided by consumer courts are on medical negligence. You will be surprised to hear why is he exaggerating this 12%? It is just 12% of uh, consumer court. I just uh, want to, uh, you know, uh, make you understand earlier 
the consumer courts were discussing something related to the food adulteration uh, isi standards and all those things but now 12% of the consumer courts they are discussing about the medical negligence they are discussing about the hospitals and the doctors so we as medicos should upgrade our legal knowledge regarding these things yes first thing i will cover regarding the consent a brief thing about consent we all know there are two types of consent one is express consent and implied consent when a patient comes to you to your clinic for physical examination it means it is implied consent you need not take a signature for the physical examination next is something what we call it as express consent express consent again has two uh, types one is verbal and another one is written consent so verbal consent we all know and the written consent is usually for any invasive techniques or for any major operations so these are the types of consent we deal commonly and as a doctor i think in general the patient should ordinarily be told everything that is what we call it as full disclosure but the doctor has to decide after all the consideration that how much can be safely disclosed i think uh, uh, we have uh, seen uh, this sort of situation in a medical college or in a corporate hospital wherein you just diagnose a patient as the end staged cancer and you don't know whether to tell him now or to their relatives or you have to tell later this is a situation wherein the person you have diagnosed recently that it is a end staged cancer and the person will not leave for another 3 to 6 months but how to disclose should we tell it directly to the patient or not is the dilemma uh, it sometimes happens that if you tell the person uh, you know you will just leave for 3 months you are uh, you have a uh, end staged cancer the person may immediately die due to mi uh, that uh, situ uh, situation may also arise but then there is something called as therapeutic privilege wherein this is an exception to the rule of full disclosure there are certain conditions where we being doctor we need not tell everything to the patient that is what we call it as therapeutic privilege and this type of situation arises uh, the presence of malignancy or an unavoidable fatal lesion which may not be disclosed if the doctor feels that the patient is not able to tolerate the condition never feel that something wrong you have done by not disclosing the condition to the patient this is something called as therapeutic privilege where suppose if someone goes against you to the court you can tell this was the reason i didn't tell it to the patient at that moment uh, coming to the rules of consent i think we are all uh, you know day in and day out we take consent forms but the age consent is you know age of the patient is very you know confusing in many of uh, the rural and urban area what we consider is above the age of 18 we think is adult below 18 we think it is juvenile so below 18 we have to take uh, consent from the parents uh, this is the common misnomer but what the law says is two different age criteria one is below 12 if the person is below 12 years the consent is of no valid the consent should be taken from the parents what we call it as loco parentis or from the guardian if the person is between 12 to 18 years he can give consent for physical examination you have to remember this uh, between 12 to 18 the physical consent can be given for the physical examination whereas uh, we all know above 18 uh, for any major operations the consent should be taken the person himself can give and second thing is mental soundness you need not have to measure his mental soundness whenever you are taking the consent just by the general consciousness uh, when whenever you see the patient you can you will get an idea that the person is mentally stable or not and the third and the most important thing is medico legal cases in all medico legal cases you have to take the consent but there are certain exceptions wherein if the person you know uh, whenever a police will get a patient for alcohol estimation or you have to tell whether the person is drunk or not in that case he will refuse that i will not give consent but what the law says is with reasonable pressure 
you have to take the consent and then do it. But then there are exceptions for informed consent. There are few conditions or situations wherein consent is not necessary. I think all of you know this. First thing is emergency. In any, any emergency where you can tell to the court or to the person, whoever person asks, why have you not taken the consent? You can just tell that it was an emergency situation and it was a life-saving situation wherein the consent I didn't take. It, it, it is accepted in the court. Many of our doctors doesn't know that. So even in the emergency, they are like busy with taking the legal document, signature of the relatives and all those things. Remember, my colleagues, in any case of emergency, you can just take this apart, do the procedures, do the treatment, and then later you can take all the consent or all the legal forms. In an emergency, no need to take an informed consent if it is a life-saving procedure. And next thing is therapeutic privilege. I have already discussed this. The frequently asked questions regarding this consent is whether we should use a handwritten consent or a printed one. The law says either ways it is fine, but it should be legible. We all know that uh, the doctor's handwriting is, you know, uh, even the doctor cannot uh, read it. Only a pharmacist can, uh, you know, read it. Uh, if it is handwritten, uh, make sure it is legible for others to read. So in law, both the uh, uh, forms are accepted. Whether the consent form should be one page or multiple pages, ideally it should be one page or if at all you think that it needs more uh, you know, pages, you can do it, but make sure you have to sign in every page of it. The third one is one procedure or multiple procedure. There are a few instances uh, wherein you have to do two or three procedures. Should we take consent for each procedure or can we just take a blanket consent? See, this is not a, you know, a, a blanket therapy uh, like that for scabies or something like that. Consent is taken for individual procedure. Remember this, even if you're doing multiple procedures, take consent for each procedure. A consent, a blanket consent is not valid. And the fourth one is on the day or delayed procedure. Uh, we will we, encounter so many uh, instances wherein the patient will come for the surgery. He will tell something, maybe uh, a day or something like that. And I will tell, sir, the, uh, today the day and time is not, uh, you know, usually this happens in elective surgeries, uh, especially in OBG as well. They will tell, sir, the date is not auspicious. So we'll come in a later date. Maybe they will come after a week or five days. So do you think the consent which you have taken earlier will be valid? Definitely not. Remember, uh, for a delayed procedure, you have to take the consent again. The previous uh, consent for the previous date will not be valid. So ideal consent form should have all these things. One is the diagnosis, name of the proposed treatment or the procedure which we are you're going to do, common side effects. You know, there are, a, you know, uh, if you can remember pharmacology, uh, side effects, it, it'll be like uh, 90 to 100, you can just name it. But you need not tell or write all the side effects. Anything which is more than 10% and above, you can just mention the common side effects of that particular treatment. And you have to also tell the patient about any alternative methods, risks and prognosis if no treatment is given, probability of success. This is one thing which we as doctors face. Many of my colleagues tell, uh, a patient tell, I mean, uh, if you want to subject him to operation, they will tell what is the percentage so that the person will survive? Is it 10%, 20%? As a doctor, it is like very difficult for us to tell whether it is 50, 40 or in, in, in percentage, but uh, you just have to tell the probability of success if the uh, surgery is not done. And you have to clearly mention about the date and time. So these are the things which uh, consent form should be there. I think most of the corporate or the government hospital, they have a consent form, which is like, you know, literally we will not write anything apart from the operating uh, procedure. So make sure whenever you sign, 
all these things will be there when you operate because when we do the operation nothing will nothing will happen but whenever something goes wrong and when the that document goes to the court is what the you know uh, the, the thing uh, begins they will start asking question for each and everything if it goes wrong so remember in each case you have to see all these things are present or not this is about the consent i hope it is clear regarding the consent form and next thing is uh, i'll talk about documents uh in the documents in the hospital especially there are different types of documents what are the objectives of this documents who is the owner of the document the case sheet is it me is it the patient is it the police or the lawyer who is the owner and how long should we have the document in patient documents we have how long should we store how long the hospital should store and how do you destroy the documents okay these are the common questions we get whenever we see the case sheets you know case sheets uh, i think if you have worked in a government hospital there will be a uh, you know a document section wherein uh, the entire room the entire uh, three four rooms will be filled with files nobody knows in which year it was and all those things okay so we'll have understanding about these documents first thing why do we require the documents be it outpatient inpatient as a hospital owner as a doctor why am i concerned regarding the you know uh, keeping the documents in the uh, of the patient one is for the medical research we all know that we are both treating teaching as well as in the research physicians so for the medical research these documents play an important role and if you are planning a retrospective a study this will be of help second thing is for the insurance claim any injury suits or in the court cases medical audit or statistics especially in the government uh, setup they will ask this and especially in the negligence cases they will ask in detail about each and every day's progress report so uh, these are the things why we store the documents uh it's a famous show in kannada karnataka wherein uh, they you know they, they'll take documents from birth till death so uh, any time they may ask the documents of that particular person but this is not legally important so what are the documents that uh, you know we have to store in the hospital the investigations which we commonly do like x rays ct scan mri the lab investigations the drugs the injections which we prescribe and the prescription form these are the things that we can give it to the patient during at the time of discharge we can give it in all the cases but in few cases we should not give this investigations remember this we can give all the investigations the original ones in almost all the cases but in case of medico legal cases wherein the legal um, issues will be there in that particular cases you should never give the documents the investigations or the uh, whatever the treatment aspect of that particular person no means no in medico legal cases even if it is a simple medico legal case or the you know it may be up to the death remember in all medico legal cases you should never ever give the original investigations to the patient what you can do is you can just write the discharge summary in a case sheet or in a uh, piece of paper you just write the details of everything write the investigations and give it to the patient never ever give the investigations because uh, sadly uh, there are so many lawyers who are practicing who just want the discharge summary and they will just go through everything in detail about the hospital whatever you have written and they will just point out the negative aspects of it and they will come back and uh, you know they will threaten the doctor or the hospital telling that these were not given not done all those things so what the law says is never give any investigation original investigation in case of medico legal cases and how long should we store this documents like in patient and all those things uh what the apex body says is 
like MCI and NMC in their uh, thing, they say inpatient records or the indoor records, you have to store for three years. Request for medical records. Suppose a patient requires or he re uh, requests uh, for the inpatient. It is yeah, the hospital or the doctor should provide within 72 hours. Anything related to PCP entity act, it should be for two years. And medical legal cases, the case sheet or whatever the documents related to that particular case, you have to store for a minimum of 10 years or till the case is solved in the courts. And we all know how long it takes uh, in our, uh, you know, Indian judicial system, like uh, we, have, we have seen that it takes, you know, more than a decade, two decades and so. But in medical legal cases, what they say is uh, for 10 years, you have to keep it. How do we destroy the records? You just have to fire or, uh, you know, you just have to throw it or give it to the person who takes uh, the old papers. It's not like that. So before the destroying the records, what we have to do is we have to display or tell the uh, persons or you can just have a give an advertisement in the newspaper that, uh, you know, so from so and so in pair records, we are going to destroy whoever wants the case, they can come and take it. So I think you, you would have seen in the newspapers where in a few hospitals advertise that, uh, you know, we, they're going to destroy and all those things. But currently, the trend is now there are so many softwares wherein uh, like Practo and other uh, software companies where they will store the documents and can be stored for uh, many years. A brief thing about negligence I will discuss with you all. Uh, there is a textbook definition of ne uh, negligence. I think we have uh, learned in forensic medicine or already forgotten. That is not important. What is important is just understanding the term negligence. When the court says the doctor is negligent is when we are doing something that is one is not supposed to do or failing to do something that is one is supposed to do. Just a simple understanding of negligence wherein um, the court will come to the consensus where the doctor or the health worker has done negligence or not. Uh, just a brush through of uh, the ty different types of uh, negligence we have seen. Uh, mainly negligence is of two types. One is civil and another is criminal negligence. There are so many other uh, <clears throat> negligence as well like corporate and other things. Liability of negligence. This is one important slide all of you should remember. Why? Because a negligence will be labeled to a doctor only when these four Ds are satisfied. What are those four Ds which we have learned in UG days? Our one is duty. Suppose I'm the doctor working in a hospital from eight to two and something goes wrong at three o'clock or 3 p.m. Am I responsible for something if it goes wrong, even though my physical presence is there in the hospital? So this is the first reason, duty. The doctor should be in duty, on duty. If my duty is from 8 to 2 and something goes wrong at 3 p.m., I am not responsible for whatever the untowards action in the hospital because I am not on duty, even though there is, there is a physical presence of mine in the hospital. Remember this. If it is out of your duty hours, you are not responsible. Second thing is something called as dereliction. Dereliction is a reasonable skill. The reason being, if I am an intern, if I am a JR or a senior resident working in a corporate hospital and, you know, uh, suppose an MI case comes, what they expect is the first aid treatment on to diagnose MI. They don't expect us to do a robotic surgery and treat, you know, uh, the MI immediately. So dereliction basically means the reasonable skill which a person will be compared to his standards. If I am an intern, what they expect is I have to diagnose it and the first aid done. If you don't do it, then it is a problem. If you don't give tetanus injection for a person who has, you know, RTA and all those things, then it will be negligent. Third thing is direct causation. Whatever the uh, it has happened, it should be a direct causation of uh, the injury as such. We have seen patients where we'll uh, 
especially in uh, obg and ortho i think uh, they can relate it through it uh, whatever the thing uh, that they will just relate to one uh, particular procedure done by an uh, doctor uh, i was absolutely fine doctor after that uh, operation done by that or orthopedician i started getting headache so that headache is not at all related to the procedure uh, be it uh, you know gynae or ortho but the patient always relates uh, relates to that after that procedure i got a repeated headache i got vomiting uh, that wound is not at all related to this so this you have to keep in mind if it is not related you just have to leave it there should be a direct causation and there should be a damage to the patient if there is no damage you are not negligent so these four d's you have to remember duty dereliction direct causation and damage the court should have all these four then only you are liable for negligence and also the fifth d is death so even if the doctor is negligent the patient cannot sue for negligence if there is no damage so just remember this slide if none of it fits then they cannot put you as negligent and uh, the most uh, important thing is doctor is not liable for any error in judgment or of diagnosis many a times the media exaggerate things that uh, or sometimes even uh, we as a professional uh, uh, will tell that oh you have gone to that uh, particular doctor if you had come half an hour earlier or if the diagnosis was done immediately you could uh, the you know you could have been saved this professional jousting i think uh, we have more in our profession that is uh, you know um it is uh, you know uh, evident in our practice that professional jousting i think we have we have to reduce it and don't be you you need not to worry if there is an error in judgment or diagnosis if some physician diagnoses it with a different diagnosis a different diagnosis then you are not liable and the surgeons especially for failure to cure or for bad results for any operations or for any wound it 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 is not negligent it can be a complication of that particular procedure we all know this re ipsa loquitur just means the fate or thing which speaks for itself this is basically seen in case of uh, when a patient goes to the court and just gives one uh, one slip or one x ray the x ray will be similar to this you can see here there is one uh, you know scissors inside the thoracic cavity when the when the patient complains of chest pain and they get got this uh, x ray done uh, there is nothing to explain here the thing which speaks for itself so if there is a prescription error or anything like this the patient can directly go to the court and there you cannot explain much there is something called as vicarious liability an employer is responsible not only for his own negligence but also for the negligence of his employee that is if i am a senior resident i have done something wrong myself along with the head of, head of the department or the unit head is liable for that that is what we call it as vicarious liability what is contributory negligence i think uh, you would have read this if anything goes wrong in the ot the surgeon will blame the anesthetist the anesthetist will blame the surgeon is this the contribution no the contribution is from the patient side so it is an unreasonable conduct or absence of ordinary care on part of the patient you would have told the patient to come after one day but the patient will come after one month with some complication so you are not responsible for that even the patient is responsible for that that is what we call it as contributory negligence in contributory negligence you will not be proved negligence in the court defenses against negligence this is very important therapeutic misadventure i have seen many seniors many uh, you know physicians who have worked for uh, 30 years in their phds uh, they tell uh, they have treated thousands of cases but one case he told uh, the nurse or he himself gave an injection the person collapsed and died immediately what should he do as a doctor 
thousands of cases it doesn't matter one case he has injected and the person dies immediately and the doctor will be in a shock he will not be able to explain to the relatives and and you have no uh, you know how it happens what happens in a hospital when a death occurs this i have seen in so many cases especially in my colleagues as well as in seniors wherein they gave an injection and the person dies immediately what should we do just remember what you have read there is something called as therapeutic misadventure all human being are different it is subjective a person may die immediately due to an anaphylactic reaction for some some reason if you have given a test dose no need to worry there is something called as therapeutic misadventure that will protect you in the court second thing is error in judgment a fever case you have diagnosed it as dengue but the another physician says it is due to malaria and your uh, the patient will come your, your diagnosis is wrong no need to worry it is just the differential diagnosis but remember at present it is evidence based medicine so even though you you know suspect or you think it is dengue or malaria better to subject the person to investigation and confirm it third thing is contributory negligence that is negligence from the patient next is re judicata as uh, i think a few of the doctors they tell uh, when we were practicing it was like 5 years back i did something uh, something wrong and the patient is coming now and telling that you know uh, the doctor see the prescription this is what you have written and uh, i'm going against you to the court remember re judicata means the case should be put against the doctor within 2 years of that particular thing after 2 years he cannot go to the court if something have been done in 2010 and they will go to the court remember they cannot go uh, uh, even though there are few exceptions re indicata is you cannot go to the same court again and again against one particular doctor i think all of you know that uh, the kolkata hospital wherein uh, three doctors were told to pay 5.96 crores for negligence this is the highest in the country as of now uh, it was negligence and the doctors and the hospitals were told to pay a such huge amount i will not go uh, in detail about this case uh, again it was a professional jousting it was in amri hospital kolkata and then the person went back to mumbai where it was diagnosed something else and the doctors in the hospital were held negligible uh, negligent because they were using high dose of steroids and that caused a condition called as 10 toxic epidermolysis necrosis of that particular patient uh, that particular patient and eventually the patient died yes what should we do in case of broad dead cases i think this is one thing when you are practicing as a junior doctor in a primary care or in a corporate hospital you are in a dilemma whether to go and see the patient or you just have to stay back broad dead cases even we as a young doctors when we were practicing in hospitals this is a common dilemma the hospital staff tell please don't go or you don't get admitted are in a certain um, situation wherein the even though we you know that the person is dead you have to or take him to the hospital do all the protocols and then declare him dead this is one thing so what you have to do is what law says is all the broad dead cases should be informed to the police irrespective of whether it is mlc or not all broad dead cases remember should be informed to the police it is up to the police whether they will decide you require a topsy or any legalities or not as a doctor or as a duty doctor what we have to do is you just have to inform the police that it is brought dead and there are few other conditions wherein the media the lay person will accuse us telling that even though the person is dead they have taken to the hospital uh, you know uh, for half an hour they have given a huge bill just to declare him dead we have seen that wherein uh, you know you don't know whether the person is uh, you know really dead or not there is protocol in the hospital wherein we have to see for certain vitals 
it will take 15 to 20 minutes. We have done all the things and then only we will declare him dead. So we'll pay for this uh, thing. This is uh, always, uh, you know, an, um, a difficult uh, thing for a doctor, for a young doctor to deal with. But remember, you just follow the law and nothing goes wrong. All broad dead cases, you have to inform the police. Next in broad dead cases, uh, I think uh, you would have experienced this as well. Uh, usually we have this conception of death certificate. So whenever a patient dies, either in the hospital or in the house, they will call you, doctor, please, uh, can you please come and give a death certificate? Remember, death certificate is not given by the doctor. I repeat, the death certificate is not given by the doctor. The death certificate is given by the government authority, either a municipality or the corporation. What we give is something called as MCCD, which you have learned in UG days. That is medical certification of cause of death. Remember, we will never give death certificate to any patient. So there are two forms. Uh, I hope all of you know this, this form four and form four A. One is for the institutional death. Suppose a person dies in the hospital, you give one form. And if the person dies in the home, you know a patient, you have been treated him for long, then it is um, Form 4A for non-institutional deaths. So institutional it is Form 4, non-institutional it is Form 4A. The common mistakes done by doctors during clinical practice is, first thing is, we'll take an improper consent. Remember, in each case, you might have treated so many cases, but if one case goes wrong, it will be very difficult for us. So take a proper consent. I've told you what are the things that should be there in the consent form. Second thing is improper documentation. Documentation is very important. It will come into scene only when the patient dies or only when that case is taken to the court. We have seen these two are the paramount important, you know, consent and the documentation. If you, if you do, do two things properly, nothing will can go wrong. Third thing is lack of legal procedures. That we cannot help because the legal aspects has been not taught much in our UG days. You know, a law was never part of MBBS. You ask a radiologist, they will tell, I didn't know whether, uh, you know, I should not do scanning and I should not reveal the gender. As a medico, I think uh, we have to upgrade ourselves and we should, be, we should be knowing the laws related to the medical fraternity. As a doctor, I think there are very few, uh, you know, acts that uh, are related to the medical profession and we have to know that. Not knowing the law, you cannot tell that, you know, being a doctor, I, I just practice. I didn't know that we should not reveal the gender. That cannot happen. As a doctor, you should know the law of the land and you should follow the law. Doctors are the soft doctors, uh, soft targets. I, no, no doubt about this. Uh, you know, if you tell a junior resident or a senior resident to read 20 pages or 100 pages in uh, Harrison, he will be very happy to read and you know next very next day he will come with that 20 or 100 pages of harrison but if you tell them to you know handle a medical legal case it's very difficult they will step back they don't want you know uh, that uh, with the police or the lawyers and all those things i i suggest you friends you should know about the law of the land and if you know you can tackle any issues without any problem. Uh, just a brief thing about the global scenario of health. In American, it is pro-victim. So the government always will be pro-victim. So doctors should uh, you know, be very careful in their uh, practice. Whereas in UK system, it is pro-professional. The government always supports the professionals, be it a doctor, they will support the professionals. So if it is the patient who has to prove in the court something has gone wrong against the doctor. That is UK system. What about India? Are we safe from the government side? 
are we unsafe from the government side but what we have seen the media i think uh, you know every time they will point to the doctor he he has killed the patient the doctor has killed without you know uh, that treatment the person would have survived and all those things and i they they'll blame every other death to the doctor that is the scenario in india but let me tell you luckily the indian courts follow english law so it is pro professional so even if it goes wrong against the doctor the government will definitely support the professional the patient has to prove the negligence in the court till then we can just uh, stay calm the doctor has the hospital can just keep quiet till it is uh, produced in the court rapes or locator as i told is an exception for this thing and if at all we do anything something wrong we are thinking that my name will be you know taken off from the association i think uh, recently also uh, the uh, kmc or karnataka medical council or uh, uh, every other state has a medical council where they will give a warning and then penal or all those things what exactly do you mean by penal eraser is removal of medical practitioner's name from the register temporarily or permanently as a penalty first usually this will not be there they will give a warning second thing is when doctor is guilty of serious professional misconduct or what we call it as infamous conduct and the consequence is doctor cannot practice medicine till his name remains removed from the register so always think if anything goes wrong or uh, you know a uh, police cannot register an fir immediately to the doctor so if something goes wrong if something you know uh, uh, three or 30 people gather in a hospital and suddenly we have seen videos uh, in social media wherein a doctor you know just runs away the hospital is ruckused uh, by the patient attenders you need not worry i mean if it is insurance it will be claimed and uh, as a doctor i am telling you you can also go against the patient against the patient but it is very sad to tell that 99% of the case always a patient will go against the doctor but then only 1% the doctor will go against the patient the reason being my name will be come in the media my name and fame will be gone my practice will be gone all the these are the things that we uh, they will consider that is true to certain extent as well so there's something called as professional death sentence that is not you know hang the doctor or something like that it is basically a professional death sentence is in the name of doctor is removed permanently he cannot practice for life this is uh, you know uh, it happens in very rarely it happens very rarely and uh, only in gross negligence this will occur infamous conduct is uh, act of a doctor which would be reasonably regarded as disgraceful or dishonorable by the professional brethren of good repute and competence as doctors i think we have all read so many things you know treating so many things we have to be ethical there are certain issues which we have seen as professionals there are things that is going away as well we cannot blame the Uh, media every time we cannot blame the you know government organization every time we should also be ethically correct sometimes so what are these things is uh, just a picture of a movie wherein you know uh, the hero is a doctor and he practices with alcohol that is not allowed and we tend to give fake certificates for you know our near and dear ones even if they he is not suffering from any disease we'll just write the person is you know having a typhoid so he needs you know uh, one day or seven days rest please don't do all these things advertisement of doctors not advised adultery having relationship with the patient abortion and taking gift from the pharma uh, these all the things that we as junior doctors or young doctors should avoid 
uh, famously called as the six A's of serious professional misconduct. I think all of you know, one is alcohol, abortion, addiction, advertising, adultery, and lastly, association with the pharma companies. We should avoid all these things. A brief thing before I conclude about the COVID situation and the medical legal issues. Uh, if you are working in a hospital where an death occurs in a COVID ward, what should we do? Is the first question the young doctors asked me. Ask me, what should we do? Should we give it, uh, give the body to the, you know, hand over to the relatives and uh, wash our hands, or should we inform to our higher ups? Is the question removal of body from isolation room? That is one thing. If it is COVID positive, remember, first thing you have to do is you have to remove all the tubes, drains, and catheters. Everyone should be wearing PPE, be it doctor or any healthcare workers, even the group D workers should wear a PPE. Plug all the orifices and then it should be put in a leak proof plastic bag. Similar to this, I think uh, most of the hospitals supply this uh, body bag, wherein the body, uh, only the face is visible and the cover can be lifted immediately from the hospital. Remember, COVID, if it is positive, autopsy is not done. If it is non-MLC, no autopsy at all. There is no question of autopsy. If it is MLC and the person has committed suicide or if it is due to accident, you just uh, have to see whether it is confirmed or suspected. And what the guideline says is better to avoid autopsy in case of COVID-19 dead bodies. In the cold storage, if at all, it was in the hospital, Remember, keep the COVID bodies in a separate uh, containers, preferably in the lower containers, because if you keep uh, the COVID bodies above, there can be you know, risk of dripping of blood from the uh, coolants. Should we do embalming? This is again uh, the question I keep getting, because the person has died in Bangalore, he has to go to Bihar. Or someone has died in Chennai, he ha the body has to be uh, shifted to Hyderabad. Should we do embalming so that the body doesn't decompose? This is the dilemma usually the young doctors have. What should we tell to the doctor, uh, to the relatives? The answer is no. Embalming should not be done in COVID positive dead bodies and it should be disposed of immediately in the place wherever the person has died. Whom should we hand over the body? Should we give it to the, you know, a police, inform the police, or should we just give it to the uh, relatives? This is the dilemma. Again, uh, any COVID death, you have to inform the higher authorities, especially the government. There will be a nodal officer for every institute. You have to inform them and you can hand it over to the relatives after writing all the things and they have to uh, follow the COVID protocol. An advice to the relatives, whether cremation or burial, I think all of you know, best, is, best thing is cremation. If they are uh, burial, they have to follow certain rules that uh, uh, even the government authority should be there at the burial ground. Only five will be allowed at the place. The person cannot touch, kiss, or uh, you know, do all the end uh, rituals. Uh, after the cremation, the ash can be given it uh, given to the uh, relatives for uh, their last rites. So my sincere advice to all uh, you junior doctors is, uh, you know, before something goes wrong, we should be very careful in handling things. As I told, these are the certain things that we have to keep in mind because as a forensic expert, we have seen only the negative aspects of what others have done. The doctor would have treated 1,000 patients, one, only one goes wrong. As a forensic expert, we have seen only those wrong ones. And that's why I am highlighting all the things that we have to do uh, in case of medical legal, uh, when you, whenever you are facing a medical legal issue. Never, you know, uh, never bend down to anyone if you have done it properly and uh, always know about the legal or the law related to the medical field.
if we have done everything right no need to worry uh, we have seen uh, our own colleagues who you know uh, they'll be the toppers of the college but then one single case it will ruin their practice it will ruin their uh, name no if if you have not done and you are ethically correct and you are doing everything uh, whatever the law says no need to uh, you know worry so before doing anything wrong let us follow the steps what i have just uh, told all those things with this i will uh, you know finish my uh, uh, talk hopefully it was you know helpful for all of you any questions i'm ready to take Uh, so there's one question on YouTube. So am I audible? Yeah. Uh, so the question is from whom should we take consent if an unconscious person got admitted by a stranger for a procedure? And the second one is what is the ideal method for informing the police for a patient brought dead at midnight? Right. uh two questions yeah for the first question i think uh, from whom should we take consent in a unconscious yeah in case of unconscious people especially we will see that uh, in case of road traffic accidents or especially in the night if someone you know unknown person gets uh, them to the hospital and they are uh, usually uh, they are hesitant to get them to the hospital because there are so many legal issues what the law says is anyone can just uh, get the person to the hospital and uh, the head of the institute be it superintendent dean or the medical officer in charge he will be solely responsible so the consent and all those things as a head of the institute they can take the decision so if nobody is there the head of the institution or clinic hospital they can take a decision in case of un uh, unconscious persons and the second question is what is the ideal method of informing the police yeah Uh, in case of broad dead or any mlc cases uh, usually we have a concept that uh, we have to inform the police over phone or something like that no every hospital every uh, even the smallest of the hospital have a mlc register something called as a medical legal uh, cases register in that there will be something called as police intimation so you have to intimate the police through writing only and that intimation should be submitted to the nearest police station so it is not over the call there is a police intimation form if you do, uh, don't have it i will send a, a form of that uh, sir uh, yeah. you had told there were exceptions for rate judicata uh, what rate judicata is basically like uh, only 2 years as i told uh, usually anything uh, any case any negligent case it should be filed in the court within 2 years but exceptions is like uh, it is up to the judge to decide you can go uh, uh, against the doctor to the court but usually in small cases they will re reject if it is life threatening ones if it is something related to sexual offense ones then uh, the court may consider that's all not in all the cases usually the timeline is uh, within 2 years okay so thank you yeah. so there was another question in the youtube uh, hello sir yeah tell me uh, sir in case of a doctor gets beaten by the mob in casualty are we liable if we hit back as self defense <laughs> yeah this is uh, one thing uh, as young doctors i think uh, we are you know adrenal rush will be there and uh, if there is a mob in the hospital we tend to hit the person back and something what we call it as self defense uh no problem in that you can have a self defense if it is not harmful self defense you can uh, you go ahead but remember uh, not to you know harm the life of any person but definitely for self defense one can go against the attenders there is nothing wrong in that yes sir thank you sir yeah. 
sir there are no more doubts on youtube as well okay okay uh, sir any concluding remarks uh concluding remarks uh, what i can tell is uh, as junior doctors we have been there done that uh, uh i think we have to learn from the elders sometimes to declare death or to see the you know, you know the question was about uh, the mob the media the police so we should be you know have a bit of patience and handle the things we have seen so many cases wherein if you declare death the usually it is the third person who will raise the voice so you should be careful and uh, you know you should be mature enough to handle that mob uh, especially in case of medical legal cases and if you follow the rule of the land law of the land nothing to worry uh, you can you can just come out of it uh, sir i had this doubt you mentioned that there are certain uh, laws that we need to be aware of yeah uh, uh, like i didn't that. mention about all those things because one thing uh, is uh, uh, it depends on the you know subject uh, it will not be general so i didn't uh, discuss that yeah uh, good that you pointed out one thing is uh, mtp act i think uh, uh, it, it is more relevant to the uh, gynae and uh, radiologists mtp act i think uh, recently uh, the recent laws till what uh, weeks you can abort after that you cannot abort as a radiologist Uh, you need to know about mtp pcp ndt act and there is recent law related to uh, the pediatrics that is what we call it as poxo act poxo is basically protection of child against sexual offence act and uh, these are the acts copra act that is consumer protection act uh, and there will be amendments for all these acts i mean when when we were ugs the mtp act it was till 20 weeks now it has been increased to 24 weeks these are the amendments that we should be very uh, aware of that is one thing so because uh, in one of the cases wherein uh, my own colleague said i didn't know the law I, i just practice like this so i need not be wrong you cannot tell that in the court the court ex- ex- expects us to know the you know recent laws these are the few things i mean there are uh, we need not know everything mtp act poxo act and uh, pcp ndt act these are the few uh, acts related to uh, medical field that uh, i think uh, we should know about that thank you sir yeah uh, sir in case of penal erasure hmm. for temporary one no yeah, penal uh, erasure no oh, temporary one okay uh, in case he can the doctor can practice later will he has to register again or will be the same no no that will be revoked usually uh, first thing what the the medical uh, you know medical uh, karnataka medical council or any state medical council what they do is first thing is they will give warning that is the first thing they will do i think uh, you will be uh, aware of the fact that uh, one of the doctors who went on uh, you know to tell that corona is not uh, aerosol and all those things uh, uh, it went uh, viral and uh, kmc gave a warning so that first thing will be uh, the karnataka medical council will give a warning second thing uh, if it goes beyond that they will uh, restrict the person for they will have first of all they will not just uh, remove the name just like that there is a procedure for that what we call it as uh, you know there will be a board in the board usually if it is anesthesia anesthesia person a forensic person medicine and one person from the kmc they will have a panel ima they will have a discussion they will call the doctor what went wrong they will give one document to the kmc so based on that they will remove the name of the doctor and uh, very rarely especially in uh, you know uh, they have not removed just like that if it is a you know gross negligence instead of left hand someone has removed right hand and because of that uh, you know something happened then only they will remove um, for few days to months to years then you can revoke and uh, the same register number will continue okay thank you sir yeah uh, thank you so much uh, dr ajikul sir for uh, such a wonderful session on uh, medical legal issues faced by all young doctors like us Uh, we could learn a lot from your session sir it was really really very helpful thank and uh, look forward to more such sessions from you sir thank you so much yeah thank you